am a sex therapist and I specialize in sex, intimacy, and trauma. And I'm just like any other therapist. <laughs> so we come in, uh, we might talk about life situations, but my specialty is really talking to people about some of these intimacy injuries, some of these emotional wounds, and how they might show up in sex, how they might have been created from adverse sexual situations, but also how do we bring more pleasure, more joy, more connection, whether you're single, partnered, uninterested, but maybe disconnected from the mind and the body and the spirit overall. You mentioned something called an intimacy wound. Yeah. Can you tell me what that is? Absolutely. As human beings, we're quite wired for connection. Uh, sometimes we like to be social. Sometimes we people, but then we have a little bit of a pause where we need more time. But those are all different forms of intimacy. And for some of us, life experiences have taught us that actually these types of connections are not safe. Um, they don't feel good. We might want them, but we don't know how to have them in healthy ways. And so it creates a wounding that then permeates how we navigate through life, including our sex lives. Very interesting. You know, at Live Jasmine, where we're from, we have members that have fantasies or fetishes that maybe in the past they have shared with a partner and not had a positive response. And so now they really are only feeling safe to act out that fantasy or fetish through Live Jasmine, where they know it's an almost guaranteed positive experience, you know, and, and that's the place to do it. Is that is that potentially what could be considered an intimacy wound where you have a fantasy and you share that with a partner and they are just really upset or turned off by that fantasy? And then maybe that makes you withdraw or feel like you shouldn't share yourself in that way anymore. Absolutely. You hit the nail on the head, right? As human beings. Beings, we are allowed to have our fantasies, we are allowed to have our desires. And so when someone is shamed or ostracized for it, in a healthy and connective relationship, it's now saying, actually, I'm not safe. Um, who I am is not okay with you. And so we start to adapt and maybe shield or find connection, safety, acceptance, other places. But also I'm hearing you describe that there is an access here. So it's not even just about, am I okay? Am I normal? Uh, because perhaps the partner's own stuff was showing up <laughs> in that moment, right? But then I have the opportunity to talk about it, to maybe even enact it in some ways that are normative to people. You know, whenever I talk to therapists like you or researchers or psychologists, one of the things that I hear a lot is that people in general just don't even really understand the basics of their sexuality. We don't really, due to education or lack thereof, we don't really even have a good foundation most of the time. Of course, there are the outliers and exceptions to the rule, but in general, I always hear that most people just don't even have that foundation. I'm curious, just to try and give a little foundation for people, what would you describe as our sexuality? What is that? Whoa, that's such a juicy question, right? Sexuality has actually become a bit of an umbrella term, so it could encompass our sexual identity, our sexual expression. Our gender expression has also fallen under sexuality for a lot of people as well. And so if we wanted to give it a generalized uh, offering, I would say our sexuality is how we embody, express, and identify the facets of us that might be related to our reproductive health and organs, but it also might be related to our intimacy, our sense of connection, and the parts of us that we reserve for ourselves and chosen others. As I've noticed that people in general are uncomfortable with even just talking about sexuality, I'm sure you see this a lot where you might get couples who are 
maybe having the physical act of intercourse, but they don't talk about their needs or their wants, or it's almost like that is too intimate, even though they're physically coming together. So I'm curious, why do you think it is that we are so uncomfortable talking about or even experiencing really deep, deep levels of intimacy, even though it seems like that is something that we crave the most, even, you know, there are people who feel uncomfortable holding eye contact too long. That's too intimate for them. I'm curious where you think this comes from. In my head, I'm like, okay, okay, which one is not the most provocative phrase to say? (laughs) But I would say we get to acknowledge, especially in in Western society that we have a very big dominator culture, okay? We have a long history of colonization, of patriarchy. However, everyone is wounded by all of this. Somebody needs to be on top. Somebody has to be uh, the, the man or the important one, the alpha, et cetera, right? And so that trickles down to everyone, whether you're non-binary, you are in same-sex relationships. And so I bring that up because instead of us being able to say, we get to be individuals, you get to want what you want. We have a lot of social conditioning that says, actually, the way you show up is to be socially acceptable. The way you use sex, the function of sex is as a duty to someone else. Um, It is to find comfort in your body because now you're using your erotic capital as a form of currency. So that amount of vulnerability is not really afforded in a world where in some ways sex is tokenized, right? And so it's different if you want to be a sex object, but you're in charge of that compared to kind of saying, well, this is how I know how to survive, how to navigate, to be accepted. I would say most of us do need intimacy and connection. And they come in so many different forms, right? We're familiar with it in romantic partners, but there's familial intimacy. So if you have a large family or a small family and you've built routines of connection, that's a form of it. If you have friendships, if you find there's a spiritual or religious world that you're a part of, right? So it's inherent to human beings. We are wired with the need to belong to a group. And when we find issues with that, we find ways to adapt. Going back to that social conditioning, right? We're going to figure out ways to connect, to belong, to be likable. And that's not always going to be additive to a healthy sexual paradigm. In your clients that you've seen, is there a recurrent block that you've seen in many of them to having a whole and sexually healthy life? Actually, I would say yes. In the folks that I see, and I should probably specify, I I see individuals and couples. Um, I see folks who come from religious backgrounds, how some people might define as conservative, as cult uh, following as well. Um, I also see high-performing individuals, right? So my folks are all they got it going on. <laughs> They've done what they're supposed to do. Uh, but the biggest pattern is self-trust, right? So they have really never figured out who it is they desire to be. Um, they're not familiar with their yeses and their nos. They've done all of the prescribed actions that were laid out either by family or culture. And now they're kind of like, yeah, but this doesn't turn me on. <laughs> <laughs> this doesn't work for me. This partner doesn't work for me or this dynamic doesn't work for us if it's a couple. So a lot of it is unpacking and discovering who they are as individuals or within the system if it's a couple in ways that they either never thought to or they've not been afforded to previously. You know, it's really interesting because I think, and I've interviewed tons of members from Live Jasmine. And I think one of the main benefits they perceive, whether it's conscious or not from the platform, is that it's a space where they 
can explore themselves sexually and they can get to know themselves sexually and figure out what they like or they don't like. There are members who are who have told me they were always really curious about something, but then once they kind of acted it out, it just wasn't for them. But they needed to know, you know, they needed to try. And when I think about it and when I hear stories like that, I always think about the fact that actually we don't have a lot of encouragement to really explore who we are sexually, even though it is such a primal foundational part of being a human being. I mean, how do you think we propagate the species? But there's drives there, you know, and um, there aren't a lot of spaces to talk openly about sex or to learn ourselves in that way. You're right. Honestly, even if you, well, it probably would not come up but on your end with your members, but I know at least on my end, when I do a sexological history and I ask people about self-pleasure, what some would call masturbation and how they started for a lot of people with issues with sex, sometimes their capacity to actually masturbate healthy, to find self-pleasure, maybe they had a house full of people, so it was rushed. So they learn how to interface with their body, with their orgasm in a way where it's just kind of like, okay, I have to do this quick. So already lack of exploration of pleasure. We're responding to things that are organic, that our body just does <laughs> and trying to figure out ways to alleviate that or to find a release, relief pleasure. But we don't actually have the time and space during our developmental years to kind of say, I like this. We don't have words oftentimes to be able to say, ha, huh, how do I play with touch or smells or just moving around? We're just trying to figure it out in the most discreet way as possible. And then we're in relationships <laughs> where maybe we have the room to explore it, or maybe we're using this other person's sexual template to figure out what that means to, for, and about ourselves and our sexuality. In your time as a sex therapist, is there something that through your experience working with clients changed your mind about how human sexuality works, where you had an idea or a perception of it prior, but after all of this experience and seeing people working through their sexual identity, sexual identities, it shifted your mind about something. Mm. Jeez Louise. Huh. I, I could say that there are many things, honestly. Um, what I think I'll articulate though, is my understanding of human attachment and trauma has actually been very helpful. Um, most people come into my office and they have this thing that's causing distress. And it's kind of like, yes, this is the thing that we're working on. And what I've learned about attachment and connection and trauma responses, whether or not someone identifies as having gone through a traumatic event, I learned how people have oriented themselves to the world, how they find connection and partnership and also how they might use sex to cope, to find connection, or to actually find this reciprocal dynamic in ideal healthy relationships, right? So just understanding that drive and need for belonging. And this includes online, right? We have places like Live Jasmine, we have artificial intelligence like Chat GBT. Uh, we have the real sex dolls that came out like so many years ago because we're really seeing how important it is to be in these safe spaces. And I think understanding that really allowed me to be way more comfortable with sexual content because it is the bug, not the feature. With that in mind, if you were able to give a message to everyone in the world about their human sexuality, what would you tell them? Oh, everyone in the world. Oh my goodness. Something <laughs> you think that you people don't wrong. get right now. Their bodies are normal. Their bodies do what they are supposed to do. There are exceptions. Uh, 
pain, differing abilities, but even still, we are entitled to enjoy sexual pleasure. We're entitled to explore our yeses and nos and to have that be respected. And there is a whole capacity to just explore what it is that you like, what it is that you might want to come back to, and to take advantage of that. Be curious. Don't judge. Just be curious and then move from there. I love that. I love that. Be curious. Yeah. So if there's someone who's listening, that's just thinking, I don't know myself sexually. I don't know where to start. Where would you tell them to start? Oh, I would tell them to start checking in with their gut. Just the fact that they are questioning this and it's like, okay, wait a minute. (laughs) I have conflicting values is a thing. But I would also say find some very sex positive resources. Do some reading. There's tons of videos out here right now, right? Look up pleasure. Look up um, positive sexuality. You have ASEC, um, World Association of Sexual Health, who even has standards around sexual health because sexual rights are human rights, right? Children's rights are human rights. These are not things that are moral equivalents at all. You're entitled to explore your sexuality, no matter where in your life story that you are. And also understanding that some of these uh, sentiments are other people's values around something that doesn't belong to them. It's their values, their fears. You don't own that. Yeah, very well said. Do you have any patients that are using either a cam site, some form of AI? Honestly, no. Most of my patients, they might say, hey, I have an issue with self-pleasure or pornography. Um, I'm not seeing the ones who are connected with AI, and I suspect it's because it works for them. <laughs> I, I've more just seen a lot of conversation in this field around the role AI fantasy and pleasure play with human development or lifelong sexuality. And I've, I've been changing my tune a little bit, the more that I hear from, from real folks who actually engage and feel a benefit from it. I'm curious, what is some of the feedback that you've been getting? I would say initially I'm on board with a lot of people that say, listen, this is very much a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a responsive system. It's not real, as most people would say. So there is a bit of a danger in people allowing the fantasy to be conflated with actual transactional relationships. So that's the baseline. With that being said, We've spent uh, the past three, four years in a pandemic. So loneliness was one of the biggest issues. And if this is something that helps people feel connection, uh, a sense that there is an interaction, I actually do support it. Additionally, there are people who don't have the same amount of access. We forget very easily if you're able-bodied, if you're available to be in large groups of people, that there are folks who might live in rural environments, who might have sensitivities, where this is actually a really wonderful source of connection, of pleasure, of fantasy for them. And my only opinion, as I continue to take (laughs) in the information, the opinion might change, is that it is valid and important to understand how we interface with it. What are your thoughts on camming or these transactional relationships that can develop where people are paying to get their needs met? Honestly, I my opinion, how do I want to phrase this? My opinion on it as a person is kind of like, listen, it's a transactional relationship people are paying to get their needs met. (laughs) The same way you would anything else, we have such a big bad around it because it's sex, because it's intimacy. And again, we're putting our stuff on other people's needs, wants, and desires, right? Um, Now, as a professional, I think it's really important to understand that people are going to find what they need. And we've seen it with um, OnlyFans come out 
how normalized all of a sudden this process becomes because we understand that sex work is work. <laughs> sex work is work, modeling is work, camming is work. And so these people are providing a service that other folks are more than happy to say, I want, I need, I desire. And then there's ideally always a negotiation that happens. So everything is consensual. Everyone gets the desired outcome from this transaction. And again, who am I to judge how people enjoy their lives, how people conduct their business, especially if it's above board? And you know what? Even if it's not above board, <laughs> because there's a big conversation around legalizing, decriminalizing sex work. So even that language, I'm always trying to uh, check in with myself around just understanding the context of sex work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's really, really interesting. You know, you mentioned OnlyFans and that phenomena happened really it really took off during the pandemic when people were feeling more isolated and were feeling more lonely and wanting to, first of all, on one hand, on the creator's hand, they needed to make a living still. And many people lost their jobs and they were at home and needed to find a way to make money. So that's one really important aspect. Many of those people are identified as women. You know, that is one thing about camming and the subscription content that can be explicit. This industry predominantly is actually serving women. They are some of the main creators of the industry and they are probably the ones, well, they are the ones benefiting and profiting the most. And it's solving childcare crisis for single moms that are at home. So there are benefits that aren't talked about as much, but then you have the other aspect where people were feeling alone and isolated. Many people couldn't travel to see their families. They were kind of, you know, stuck in quarantine wherever they were. And so they wanted to feel connected to people. And then this interesting thing happened where, like you said, it, it, it normalized almost, we're still getting there, but it, from where it was to where it is now, it almost normalized the industry. Now you have Absolutely. mainstream celebrities that are on OnlyFans. <laughs> I think, um, who is it? There's someone from team mom. I think it's Tyler from team mom. If people remember that show from back in the day, but yeah, there's like regular people who we've grown up seeing and it's like, absolutely, this is a viable source. And so the more we're able to normalize things, the more we talk about it without shame, we're curious. We see the benefit. You described a business model essentially, right? People will say, if you want to make a lot of money, you want to have a decent industry, you find something that people need, right? So here it is. People needed this connection. They need maybe the entertainment, the outlet, the intimacy. And so, yeah, how is this very much different than anything else that we do? Absolutely. I'm curious. I know I'm, I'm asking the, the big questions today, but what would you say are some of the biggest mis misconceptions that people have about sex and human sexuality oh my goodness that sorry yeah that is a really big question but you know what i'm more than happy to answer from my perspective some of the biggest uh, misconceptions is that we have ownership over other people's bodies or that other people's sexual responses mean something about us and that goes back to that desire to connect, to belong, to be accepted, right? Is we can't often differentiate. But the key to sexual intelligence is to be able to have a good understanding of self first, right? You have to know your own sex system, your sexual values, your turn ons, turn offs. You can explore with your partner, but, or, or partners, or just the, across your life experience but you're primarily responsible for that. And I think a lot of the people in trying to find homeostasis or their neutral ground, 
they give it away to a lot of other people. We assert blame a lot of other places as opposed to understanding this is your body and you get to say what works, what doesn't work, period. The way you phrase that, one of the biggest misunderstandings is that people have ownership over someone else's body or sexuality because, you know, we see that clearly in society where we try to police um, socially people's sexualities and what they're doing or not doing at Live Jasmine. We certainly see people trying to police models through stigma and shame. But it's interesting because even in relationships, people believe that they own their partner's sexuality. And if their partner has a particular fantasy or interest or maybe wants variety, that it means something about them, like you said. And it doesn't. It doesn't. And it's such a two-way street, right? If we go back to that sense of self-honesty, uh, if I am a partner and I have all these fantasies, these desires, and I want to explore, that's different than just, I have these fantasies and desires, and that's just a part of me. We get to be clear with what we need and want and honest and transparent with our partner in order to also mitigate some of the things that might not be said, but maybe they're felt, uh, some of the things that are maybe implied because again, if I have a partner and maybe that's not what I want, but I know you have all these desires, we now have an insecurity. We have a crack <laughs> in this idea of, okay, I'm connected. You feel safe and secure for me. So it's two ways, right? We can't judge and shame and blame someone for what they like. They like what they like, right? But we also have to be honest with ourselves so that we can find compatible partners, whether that means you're the one who I have these sexual adventures or explorations with, or you're someone who understands and accepts me fully and completely. When we're seen and heard and understood, there is a connection that we're available to form independent of geography or anything else. And people are willing to invest in it. That is a stable source of connection that you can find anywhere but especially on live Jasmine. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> no, that was really well said. I'm curious if there's anything about human connection, sexuality, your work that we haven't talked about, but you want to share. Oof. I would say really and truly when it comes to sexuality and sexual connection, there's so many possibilities for expansion and personal growth, right? If we start to look at ourselves as adaptive people, but not necessarily trying to ward off um, intimacy injuries or wounds, we can flip it to say we're also adaptive to being able to expand, to take in information, data, somatic wisdom, emotional wisdom, we start to then kind of say, okay, the messages we've had around ourselves, around our bodies, around our yeses, noes, what's good, wrong, bad, can be shifted, right? And so we've talked about it a little bit, but I just think there's an opportunity. Any level of society you can think of that's impacted someone, you can find a remedy or an antidote through sexual exploration, even spiritually financially speaking, right? What does it look like to either be able to pay for a transaction, to receive money um, from a sexual connection, or to kind of say, I know this person values me independent of what I provide for them. There's room just to grow as people as opposed to objects in this world. Very beautifully said. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, very beautifully said. From your perspective, from your experience, what are our next steps, either individually or collectively, in building a more sex positive or sexually healthy society? Self awareness. <laughs> it sounds so 
so simple, but sometimes it's even just tuning into what riles us up, what offends us, what makes us feel excited to see, is that a personal value or is that a script or a role that you've adopted from someplace else, right? Because we start to find our own sexual quilting, sexual fabric, as opposed to simply regurgitating uh, moralized values from other places, right? So sex positivity and changing that paradigm comes from really challenging our own beliefs and practicing curiosity and acceptance of others. You don't have to like it. You don't have to do it. But we really don't need to judge or shame it in that power play of being a better person. Have your values, let other people have theirs, and let's just be in a space <laughs> where we tend to our own gardens. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I, I don't know when we're going to finally get it that human beings really are actually not controllable. I think that we're still under this illusion that we can force people to be a certain way. And even if you can coerce someone's actions, which can happen, you have not changed who they are inside. Someone is still who they are. Only that person can change themselves. So this idea that we can make everyone like us or do the things we like or don't like or whatever the case is, it's really a big illusion because we cannot control human beings. And we have seen this throughout history, you know? Yeah. Be in service to liberation. And I, I know a lot of people don't love talk, talk about the fact that we have this very dominant type of world that we live in, especially in Western culture. I'm going to keep saying that <laughs> because it's true, but all of these things are power grabs in order to feel important, to feel that we're right. And when you're in service to liberation, to a path of pleasure, you don't have to do that at all. You're comfortable and secure and you know how to get your needs met with whom to get your needs met. And to me, I want to live in a world that's safe and connective with other well-meaning and well-balanced people. So in my opinion, that would be how you do it. Thank you so much. This has been a beautiful interview. Thank you for the opportunity. I love it.